Hey, welcome back. I wanted to show something interesting today, something that I don't think I've seen anywhere else. So about 15, 16 years ago in production, I was having this idea of using a for loop within a group inside of Nuke to create an effect where you can loop over the same type of nodes again and again and again without doing Python or creating some kind of callbacks. And I call the idea the multi-sample, and I want to show some of the stuff that I've done with it today. And here's a really simple example. I just have a piece of text, and then I plug it into the multi-sample concept, and I can increase the number of samples, and you can see it starts creating this ghost-like effect. That's because there's a little bit of transform happening on the image, but the transform is happening at subframe levels. So what this node and the multi-sample concept does, it takes a single frame, and it stretches it out X amount of times. In this case, right now I'm at 30 samples. So it stretches a single frame out for 30 samples, 30 frames, applies the effects. In this case, it's a bit of a DVE or a card 3D as it's called in Nuke, which rotates and lets you transform the image around. And it does that 30 times and then it collapses the image back down again to a single frame. So what's interesting is once you start applying things like rotation to this effect, let's go with an increment of 20. You can start seeing that we accumulate the effect across a single frame. And the amount of samples controls the quality for it. So even at 90 frames or 90 samples, it's actually generating 90 frames in between each one of the frames. So it's calculating subframes. And if you look inside the node, it's really simple. Inside the network, the first thing we're doing is just time warping everything out. So we're stretching that one frame out to X amount of samples. Then we calculate the for loop index, and we can use this as a lookup to change the parameters of the net nodes downstream. In this case, as a card 3D, we change the rotation and the scale. We do that at the top level. But we multiply each one of them with the index of the for loop. That way, we get the effect applied to the subframes with variance for each frame. Other use cases would be things like exponential glows. In this case, there's a single glow node that's being looped over for X amount of samples, and you get that classic exponential glow feeling to it. Let's recreate this setup inside of Fusion now. So I'm first going to put down a time stretcher node, and we're going to add some custom parameters to it by right-clicking and going edit controls. I'm going to call this one samples, and it's going to be a number. We want it to be an integer, and we can have a screw control with a step counter of one. So that just gives us a custom slider that we can use. I'm going to set it to one for now. And then in the source time, we're going to start stretching the current frame out. And we're going to stretch by the amount of samples that we have. And we do that by typing times divided by samples. And we're just going to offset it all by one frame. Actually, let's, let's not offset it right now. So right now, we're not doing anything. It's just doing the same frame count as before. But if we start increasing the amount of samples, let's say to four, that means it's going to stretch out the current frames four times. So that just means for every frame, you get a frame hold of four frames in between. So let's set it to something like eight. You can now see that even, even though I'm technically at frame 30, it's displaying that you're on frame four. So the next step is to create the for loop node, the node that lets us index which part of the subframe we're actually at. Let's add another parameter. You're going to call this one loop. And these are all fine. We're going to add it. So what we need to do to calculate the loop is that for each one of the main frames, we want to calculate a linear range between 0 and 1 before the next frame comes. And we do that by going into uh, right-clicking and, and creating an expression. And we're just going to take the remainder of the time against the samples. In this case, it'll be samples. And then we're going to divide by the amount of samples. We might just put this one in uh, in bracket for clarity. And if we scroll down now, you can see that at frame one, we're at 0.125, which is one eighth um, of the current samples that we have because we have eight samples per frame. And if we start scrolling through, you can see that it goes to zero to one, and then it loops back again. So later, we're going to access this as a variable to control things like the size of a blur. Uh, but for now, let's just rename the time stretcher to TS, so it makes it easier for us to access through expressions later. So the next step is to recombine all the samples, the subframes that we have, back into the original frame range. And we'll do that with a time stretcher node. 
and we'll have a look at it and we'll change the expression. And what we want to do is in brackets, we want to put time, multiply the samples that we have, in this case, ts.samples. And then we want to subtract ts.samples as well. And now we see we're on frame 13. Well, actually on frame 14. So there's a little bit of mismatch here. So let's just change that. And we'll do that by just adding the amount of samples back on again. So now we're on frame 14 on the image and we're on frame 14 back on the timeline. So if we scroll through now, it's as if we've done nothing to the timeline. But in fact, each one of these frames contain eight subframes. And those eight subframes, we can do some manipulation and have some fun with. So let's just have a look at the uh, the Nuke example that we did. And I want to drop down a DVE node so we can start doing the same kind of effect. So this is a 2K image. I'm just going to scale it down so that we get some proper speeds to it. So let's do um, 1024 by 512. So the D DVE lets you do like 3D manipulation to the images that you have. And now we have access to the looping index, which is this variable right here. So inside the DV, let's say we want to change the rotation here. We're going to do an expression. We're going to do a ts.loop. So that means for every one of the subframes, it's going to add a value between 0 and 1 to the function. So let's just multiply it to something like 90 degrees. Now, one thing you notice is that nothing really changes. And that's because we're not actually accumulating the images themselves. For that, we need to use a separate effect. And um, Jacob Donnell has been really kind and created this node called the Echo, which is a really interesting fuse. It's just, um, it creates an average or an accumulation of certain type of um, effects. And we're just going to insert it straight into the chain. And what you'll see now, it's it actually accumulates a couple of the frames that we have. Um, you can see there, it says Echo of five frames, and we want this frame number to be the same amount of samples that we have. So we're just going to type ts.samples. So that's pretty cool. The last thing you want to do in this node is just hide the source so it doesn't display the original value. And you can see that it says 19 and 20. So there's some fudging happening here between the numbers that I'm not sure how to resolve yet, but I'm sure we can figure it out by round, rounding some of the frame numbers down. But if we go back now to the um, original uh, time stretch node where we put the samples values in, you can see now if I change the amount of samples, and you, if you increase it to something like 32, it's still pretty interactive. So let's change some of the other values. Let's have a look at what we can do. Let's do the perspective as well in this direction. Let's multiply the loop value by 150. And let's do the same for the Y. Let's do 200 degrees. And you can get this 3D effect out of the DVE. It's pretty cool. But the, um, the killer application is once you start doing a more complicated thing. So if we set the sample size to something low, like 8, and we want to increase the samples, I found another solution, which is in the echo node. Um, Daniel actually uh, made it so that it supports subframes. So if we do something like four samples here, or six samples, or eight. So this is kind of like a sub-subframe sampling. So I have another image. Let's, let's have a look and see whether or not we can do some um, exponential glows on this one. So I'm just going to put down a color gain and do a bit of grading so we can create a bit more contrast in the image. I think that looks OK. We're going to copy and paste the effect. We're going to get rid of the DVE, and let's just have a look at the uh, the time stretch version. So right now it looks pretty much the same. So I'm just going to scale the image down for speed. Let's do a half resolution just so I get more interactivity to it. And let's add a soft glow. And the soft glow is generally considered to be absolutely horrible. I mean, it looks terrible. But once we start introducing the exponential function to it, it's actually quite decent. So let's do that. Let's put down uh, an expression. Uh, I'm just going to index the loop. I'm going to add one, so the glow starts at the uh, size of one. I'm going to multiply it by a small value and then take the exponent of eight so that it really gets to spread out. And these numbers, you just have to tweak to find something good. Uh, I'm quite happy with this this stuff, so let's uh, let's take down some of the, um, uh, uh, the intensity of it. And something that you'll notice is that it doesn't look like a proper glow yet. And that's because in the echo, the accumulation of the frames is set to normal. But what we want to do is actually add some of the frames together. So we'll take the alpha gain button and we'll take the slider all the way down. That way we can still retain all the detail in the image. It's just the glows that's been added. So if we start playing with this now, you can see how the glowing function performs. And um, if we change the amount of samples, for instance, let's do just four, you can see that the quality goes down. You don't get as much spread 
um, or there's um, a larger distance between each one of the blurs. If we do something like eight, which tends to be quite fine, uh, you can get some really good results. So if we disable the scale and get full resolution, I mean, it, the image looks terrible. Um, I'm well aware of that, but you can start to tweak it and get some cool effects of it. So if we limit it to just the highlights, you know, it doesn't look as bad. And you can even do a bit of color grading too. So let's make it slightly blue. So that's how you'd implement something like a um, exponential glow within this multi-sample idea. And there are other things as well. So let's just check out some more stuff. Let's use the same example. Let's use the uh, the image of this uh, eight millimeter camera. Uh, we're not going to do soft glow, but what we are going to do is a fast noise, which is just uh, a bit of noise that we can use to displace the image. We are going to use a displacement node. Uh, we're going to distort it in X and Y, but we actually want 3D vectors out of this noise. So I'm going to make a bit of space and let's construct an image that's containing um, vector 3 noise. And we can do that by copy and pasting. Sorry, we want to copy this and control shift V so that you create an instance of the noise, but we want to de-instance the seed. So we'll do right click de-instance and we'll create another value for it. And we're going to control um, Control shift V to create yet another one. And this one we're going to do uh, instance as well and just change the value to something else. And now we have a red, green, and a blue one. So let's combine them. We can do that with a custom tool. So we're just going to write, connect all of these together. And in the custom tool, we can write channel one is R1. And this is, let's say, green two and blue three. Uh, the last thing we want to do is just normalize them between uh, zero and one. And we can do that with. by subtracting 0 0.5 and multiplying by 2. And we'll do the same for, for all of these. So red 1, red 2, red 3. So now we have a vector that goes between 0 and 1, uh, sorry, minus 1 and 1, and we can use that to displace the image. In fact, we actually don't need the third component, the, uh, the, the, uh, the blue channel. That's for when you're doing 3D distortion. So let's just have a look at what this does without any of the effects, without any of the multi-sample effects. So let's plug it in. And we want to do X and Y based on red and green. Let's just have a look at it. And if we connect the custom, the output of the custom tool to a gain, that means we control the, the amount. And you can now see that it's it's kind of distorting in, in all the directions at the same time, rather than just pushing it you know, in one single direction. And that's because we have vectors going from negative to positive. Let's connect the displacement to the chain of the multi-sample idea. And when I plug it in, you can see that nothing is happening, even though it is happening if we do it outside of this chain. We can have a look at the distortion here, but if I plug it in and view the uh, the end result, nothing's happening. And that's because Fusion needs uh, a few more frames on the timeline to work with. So we just set the, um, the render range to something like 200. You can see that now the effect is applied. It's just because the way the time stretching works creates all these funky interdependent frames that, you know, have multiple nested timelines within them. It, it gets all really weird, but it, it kind of works. So what we want to do now uh, is now that we have everything working, it's all being displaced the same thing at the same time. The thing we should change now is to see the rate, how much change should happen in between each one of the subframes. And this is where the interesting effects are coming. This is something you can't do without the multi-sample concept or at least without daisy chaining a series of displaced nodes after each other, including different fast noises for each one of the frames. So if we change the seed frame now, you can create these really interesting effects of the displacement and happening over several frames and then gets averaged together to create an interesting um, sort of displacement effect. So let's change the seed rate even further, you know, something more extreme maybe change the scale of the whole effect. And let's change the actual displacement scale as well, so something like 20. You can create this interesting, interesting uh, effect here. And if you go back to the echo node, and we increase the number of subframes, right now it becomes brighter and brighter and brighter. So we'll have to compensate that in the echo. It, you know, it's all screened together now. I think we should probably set it to normal. And the reason why it's now added together is because if you do a normal operation and you put the alpha gain down, that's basically an add. So we need to compensate for this now. And we can do that 
quite easily because we know the amount of samples that we have. We have eight samples here in the main loop and then in the subframe loops in the echo node, we have eight frames. So it's eight times eight. So we'll put down a color gain and we'll just do an expression of eight over eight is um, eight times eight is 64. So we'll do one over 64. So that gives us the same color range back. So this effect is quite interesting. There's lots of stuff you can do with it. Um, it is, however, incredibly prone to not working. I mean, you're dealing with like nested timelines for each one of the frames. So doing animation with a multi-sample idea is not really working. I mean, there are cases where it's trying to look at frames that doesn't exist or look at frames that hasn't been calculated yet. So it is a bit fiddly to use. Um, for things like maybe the soft glow, it works fine. But for like more com complex things where you want to inject uh, keyframes or custom animation, it tends to fall flat pretty quickly. But I thought it's, it's a pretty unique idea. I haven't seen anyone do this effect, um, either in Nuke or in Fusion or in any tool for that matter. Um, so I just wanted to share this tip with you guys today. Uh, hope you guys enjoy and I'll see you in the next video.